So, Mark chapter 1 and verse 21. We continue the gospel according to Mark. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the, their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Well, we pray that God will add his blessing to his word and speak to us as we've been praying in that last song. What sort of things catch your attention? I guess I'm thinking of perhaps uh, flicking through the TV channels going through, there's like a hundred channels now, aren't there, of almost rubbish. I wonder what catches your attention when you're scrolling through. I wonder what grabs your attention when you're flicking uh, through your scroll on your uh, smartphone, those of you that do that on social media. Or perhaps you're browsing the internet. I wonder what sort of things grab your attention. Or watching the news, what is it that um, makes your mind uh, alert? All these things... And uh, they're just full of things that are trying to clamour to get your attention. Now, 2,000 years ago, of course, in Capernaum, they didn't have any of those things. But one thing did get their attention. Jesus um, got their attention. And you know, this morning, that would be a great thing for you. If you're not a Christian, to have your attention diverted caught by the Lord Jesus Christ, to consider his life and his ministry, to consider who he is and what he's done. There couldn't be a better thing today, really, than to have your attention caught like that. Or as a Christian, you've come this morning. And if you're like me, there's so many other things that get your attention, so many other things that are clamoring, so many other responsibilities or things that would um, turn your heart and mind um, to other things It's good this morning just to have our attention grasped by the Lord Jesus and fixed upon him. You know, Mark, we're only like halfway through the first chapter, already he has presented Jesus as the Messiah King, the one who's coming to bring the kingdom of God, and he'll give it to all that will receive him. We've read about John the Baptist preparing the way, just as it had been predicted in the Old Testament. We've read about Jesus being baptised in obedience to his Father. We've read about him being tempted. We've read about him travelling north to the area of Galilee, where he would declare the good news, chapter 1 and verse 14. We've heard about Jesus beginning to preach, verse 15, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Mark doesn't hang around in presenting to us what he wants to present. Jesus is coming, he's king, get ready. What do you make of him? And already he's called his first disciples in verses 16 to 20 that we considered last week. Um, uh, he, he, he called them, they were uh, fishermen, they were by the, uh, by the sea or in the sea, they were, they were doing their business and he called them and he said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they gave up what they were doing and fell in behind Jesus and followed him. But it was as Jesus went into Capernaum, in verse 21, that he began to cause a stir among the wider population. In fact, at the end, you remember the last verse there, 28? And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. He got the attention of people in Capernaum and all around in uh, Galilee. And what had caused this stir? What caused this stir was his authority. 
We've already seen a glimpse of that authority. What other person could call people in the middle of their job and say, come and follow me, and they would. So we've seen a glimpse of it already. But now, what happens in Capernaum is going to show us something more about the authority of the Lord Jesus. And you could certainly say that these first few chapters of Mark, perhaps even up to chapter 4 or chapter 5, are all about this. This is the theme, showing you the authority that the Lord Jesus has over various aspects of life. And the first, we're just going to consider two um, things this morning. The first is that Jesus taught with authority. And that's from verses 21 and 22, and then part of 27. Jesus, he, Jesus taught with authority. He says that he walked into the synagogue, which was, of course, their place of worship for the Jews, and he began to teach. Now, I wonder um, what teachers, those of you that went to school, I guess that's most of us, a few that yeah, it doesn't include, but I wonder what teacher st still you remember in your mind. What, what, what teacher stood out for you? in your experience of school. And even if school was a terrible place, which some people find it very difficult, no doubt there'll be a few teachers that just stand out as someone that really cared, really loved, really went out of their way to help you. It was the first thing they did. When I went to, to learn how to teach maths at the uh, Further Education College, the first day, this is what they did. They got us one by one to stand at the front and tell everyone about a teacher that had made an impact in your life. Perhaps you've got one that you're thinking of right now. Jesus got their attention through his teaching, not because he was good-looking, or because he was well-spoken, or because he was super clever, but because he taught them, it says, as one who had authority. There was something different about what he did and what he said as he taught that clearly gave them the understanding that this man speaks with authority. They knew that he said something that they needed to listen to. It says that he, he was unlike the scribes, it is, uh, verse 22, who had authority and not as the scribes. He knew what he was talking about. The scribes probably were scratching at the surface, trying to suggest things and ideas, but Jesus knew what he was talking about. The scribes were corrupt. We find that elsewhere in the Gospels. But Jesus spoke with truth and integrity. The, the scribes loved to look at the details, absolutely splitting tiny hairs, the trivialities. But Jesus came and spoke about things that seemed really important and significant, things of life and death and purpose. The, the, the scribes, we find elsewhere, love to sort of ramble on. Better be careful here. They rambled on and on and on. Jesus, we find, got to the point very plainly and very quickly. The scribes, I think we can infer, when they spoke and they taught, they were dry as dust. But Jesus was captivating. He was interesting. He spoke with all sorts of illustrations. And you'll know from the parables he told, for example, how vivid his teaching was. It wasn't some kind of academic thing. It wasn't some message that was spoken just out, not, out, not in love, but just in, out of interest. Jesus spoke as a lover of souls. People could tell that he loved them, he cared about them, and he was speaking the truth to them. The, the scribes were always quoting other sources, quoting what someone else had said, but Jesus spoke with his own authoritative power. Perhaps nowhere illustrates that more than um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, when Jesus said, you know, you have heard that it was said, and he'd quote the Old Testament, and then he'd say, but I say to you, this is a man with authority. Notice as well that the authority was not just in the teaching that he gave, but it was in him himself. Verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. It was out of his own authority that he taught with authority. This authority gripped them. It was so different from what they were used to. They were transfixed. They were provoked. 
They were stirred. He said things that upset what they thought. It challenged them. We're told, verse 22, that they were astonished. We're told, verse 27, that they were amazed. And as we read Mark's Gospel, we're going to find this authority of Jesus presented again and again and again. An authority, surely, is not just something that's like an academic interest for us. It's something for us to experience. It was something for them to experience. And it's something today for us to experience. You know, I was reflecting when I asked that question earlier on about um, the teachers that struck, struck, strike you. But there were some teachers, weren't there, that they just needed to walk in the room and somehow, I don't know what it was, they commanded respect. You knew that you couldn't mess with them. You knew that they were good at what they did. You then um, disobey them because you knew you'd be in trouble. And there were other teachers. Let's just say it was quite different. There was something to be experienced in Jesus' presence that they knew that this man spoke with authority. Now, we experience this authority of Jesus most uh, of all through God's word. We've, of course, got Jesus' own words recorded, but also Jesus himself, in John chapter 1, is called the Word of God. Jesus himself, his person, he is the Logos, the the Word, the communication, the message from God, is Jesus. And the rejection of God's authoritative Word was the cause of the fall in the very beginning, when they would not listen to what God said that they must do, when he gave them a commandment that they must not eat from that tree, they refused that authority and it was their downfall and the fall of all humanity. It's also the reason why society today is in such a mess. Because as a whole, society is refusing the authority of the Lord Jesus. We look around us and we see people chasing pleasure. We see people chasing money. We find that people can't even work out what a woman is anymore. We find that the the family is being undermined and falling apart. We find that moral moral standards are, are falling and it's because we have rejected the authoritative word of God. And we do so at our peril. Let's just reflect on this the application of this, Jesus teaching with authority. What, what does it have to do with us today? It's not just a story about Capernaum 2,000 years ago, is it? The question is, is what does this authority have to do with us today? And, and if you're not a Christian, you need to know that this is at the very heart of becoming a Christian. Recognizing and submitting yourself to the authority of Jesus is what it is to become a Christian to considering what Jesus did and said and acknowledging him as Master and Lord is central to what it is to become a Christian. And living in rebellion against that is what it is to be outside of Christ. And we're warned that if we continue on that path, we will get what we ask for, which is to be outside of the authority of Christ for eternity. To be Well, we'd be under his authority, but outside of his presence. Christians, the issue of the authority of Jesus' teaching is at the very heart of what it is to be a disciple of God, to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. One of the things that we should want and, and focus on is to be good disciples of the Lord Jesus, good followers of the Lord Jesus. That's all discipleship means, following Jesus. And if we are to follow Jesus, we need to accept the authority of the teaching of Jesus. And so let me ask you, let me challenge you, is there an area of life, of your life, where you know that you are resisting the authority of Jesus? Even as a Christian, there might be things and parts of your life where you know full well that something that you're doing or something that you're thinking or something you're involved with or something that you're not doing is resisting the authority of Jesus. Perhaps there's a clear command that you're resisting, to be baptized, perhaps, to turn from your sin. 
to stop doing something, to start doing something. Or perhaps you're rebelling against some clear instruction that you know has come from the Lord and you're resisting it. Or perhaps you're just drifting from the Word of God, that the Word of God has become less and less part of your life. You're drifting away from the authoritative Word of Christ. So I just want to encourage you to experience this authority. This authority that we've been speaking about, you can experience it today as you read the Scriptures. These are the authoritative words of God. We need to yield to that authority. And we need to see that Jesus carries that authority perfectly. He doesn't abuse that authority for his own gain. Jesus hasn't come as the Son of God and with the authority that he has to do something for himself. He's come to seek and to save the lost. He uses his authority for your blessing. And to resist his authority is to resist his blessing. You know, a bit of a silly example, but you know these fields where you go around and they've got like an electric fence around the outside? What a silly thing it would be for a cow to keep walking into that electric fence. I, I, I mean, I, obviously it doesn't kill them, but it can't be very pleasant because that's the whole purpose of it. But what a silly thing it would be for a, for a cow, once it's learned that when it walks into that string, it's going to get an electric shock, to keep going back and to keep doing it would be a ridiculous thing. It would be a silly thing. And so too, God's put boundaries for us to live. And sometimes we're as foolish as a cow that just keeps going back and getting stung and finding that this is a... a, a well, it, God's boundaries are for our good, not for our harm. God's boundaries are to help you to flourish. They're for your good. And I think it's just worth saying as we're thinking about authority, that authority sometimes, for some of us, will come with a really bad sort of connotation. Perhaps you've had somebody that's been in authority over you in some way that's hurt you. Or some human authority that you feel that you've been mistreated by. Perhaps you feel that in many ways the human authority that's been placed over you has been misused. And so it's understandable that people sometimes get suspicious of politicians, or they get suspicious of company bosses, or they'll get suspicious of the police, or they'll get suspicious of social workers, or they'll get suspicious of the people that work at the job centre, or they'll get suspicious of teachers, or they'll get suspicious of just men, full stop, because of some experience that they've had. You can add to the list, but you need to know that that's been authority that's been misused, but authority is a good thing. It's a God thing when it's used well and properly and certainly when it's exhibited to us in the Lord Jesus. Don't put those thoughts of misused authority upon Jesus when we speak about his authority. Jesus spoke with authority and we should submit um, to his words. So that's the first thing. I just want to talk there about just that authority. It's clear that as Jesus came to Capernaum, it was his words that amazed people. It was the authority with which he spoke that amazed people. And I just want to encourage us, as God's people here, to be people who acknowledge that authority today. That when he speaks in his word to us, we follow what he says. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to say Jesus had authority over demons. That's from verses 27, 23 to 27. So in the course of this teaching in the synagogue, the authority of Jesus was felt in another way, wasn't it? It was in response to this authoritative teaching that this demon spoke up, this man who was possessed by a demon spoke up. You know, when Jesus, the Son of God and the King of Kings speaks, the devil himself and all his demons quake in their boots. And we must be careful. You know, did, did, did you notice that? that, that they're, they're terrified, aren't they? The, the, the demon, they were astonished at his teaching, for they taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Verse 23, and immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, 
what, must, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him. This demon was terrified of the presence of Jesus. And there's a, there's a thing here to think about. You know, we must not think about the battle between uh, Jesus and demons as being some sort of equal battle. You know, as if it's like a tug of war. I was watching the, um, uh, the Highland Games uh, thing on the BBC News yesterday. I didn't watch it all, honestly, obviously. But there was a little clip, and I thought, oh, I hadn't seen a good tug of war for a long time. And there were these guys with these massive great up now boats, and they're all standing. And you know what it's like if you get two match teams, the, the rope goes backwards and forwards, someone falls over, and it goes that way a bit. And you know, it can go on for a long time as the rope goes backwards and forwards, and then finally perhaps one team gets better than the other. That's not the sort of picture that we've got when Jesus comes into contact with some demons. It's more like uh, a tank, <coughs> excuse me, like a modern military tank at one side, and let's say a horse at the other end. Now, I was going to say a mouse, <laughs> like a, a tank versus a mouse, but I think what's important to remember is that demons are stronger than us. So perhaps a horse is a better picture. Something that's stronger than us against something that's far stronger than it. You know, a, a horse might be stronger than us, but a Challenger 2 tank weighs 64 tons. It's 8 meters long. It has a 26-litre diesel V12 engine, and it has 1,200 horsepower. By the way, did you know a horse has 15 horsepower? It's like, you know, look it up, it's true, right? right weird. Um, but anyway, the tank has a lot more horsepower than a, than a horse. There's no match. And here's the insight that we have here as we see Jesus come into contact with this unclean spirit. The unclean spirit is terrified. And Jesus, just at his word, rebukes him says, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit does exactly what he's told. Convulses him, cries out with a loud voice and comes out of him. And all were amazed. Confronted with the authoritative presence of Jesus, the demons are scared. They know who Jesus is and they are terrified. Notice what, they said, what the demon said. What do you want to do with us, Jesus, of now that you have come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. There's no match. They know that they're going to get um, overpowered. They're terrified. There's no crucifix. There's no garlic. There's no wooden stake. There's no holy water. I'm, I know I'm probably talking about vampires, but n none of this Hollywood stuff, Jesus in the presence of a real, let's, let's remember, these are real um, uh, unclean spirits. This is a, uh, the, de the, 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 the devil that is an angel, and, and these demons are, are, are angels that have followed him. They're evil angels. And Jesus just speaks. They're created beings. Jesus is the creator. And he speaks, and they go. Now, I'm not um, at the moment going to start talking about why, why or how this man was possessed. It doesn't tell us, so let's not go there today. But we are shown his authority over the enemy, his authority over demons. Later on, Jesus sends out his disciples with that same authority to cast out demons. And so if you're a Christian, you need to know that the enemy might seem formidable at times. But the Bible tells us that in Christ, if we resist him, he will flee. You don't need to be afraid. Remember, you're on the side of the tank, not on the side of the horse trying to pull the tank. I wonder if you can feel the enemy at work in your life in some way at the moment. Perhaps with some temptation. Perhaps you just look around and you see his work in the world and it scares you. Perhaps he sometimes seems to be winning. Remember the spiritual encouragement to Christians in 1 John 4, 4, which says that he that is in us, that's Jesus, through his spirit, 
is greater than he, that's the devil, who is in the world. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. The devil never catches God out. The devil never overpowers God, not even for an instant. The devil is cunning, but he never outwits God. The devil is strong, but he has no power over us once we yield to Jesus. So as a Christian, you cannot be possessed by a demon. Why would God allow a child of his to be possessed by a demon? But he can allow you to be tested. And we read that in Job. If you read this account of Job, you'll see that he was tested by the devil himself, but not possessed. This authority of Jesus means that you can overcome temptation. You can overcome temptations of the flesh. You can overcome the, the, the enemy's work in the world. You can under, overcome the work of the devil directly in your own heart. The, th the authority of Jesus means that your case is never hopeless. Perhaps you've been there at some point or another and you've just felt this is hopeless. I feel completely um, at mercy. I, I just feel I've got completely hook, line and sinker in with the devil and his ways. How could I ever be saved? Well, you're never hopeless if you are looking to Christ. The authority of Jesus means that he is able to complete the work that he started in you. You know, perhaps you're uh, thinking that sometimes. Well, I've got so far in my Christian walk, and it just feels like there's just every barrier and obstacle stopping me going further. Or you can't see how it could continue. You can't see how it's going to go ahead. Well, the Lord says, doesn't he, that he's going to continue the work that he started in you. He has the power to do it. Jesus, we're told, came to destroy the work of the evil one. 1 John 3 and verse 8. So yield to him today. And he will deliver you. He will rescue you. He will protect you. And he will keep you. So just as we close, here's the authority of the Lord Jesus in his words and the authority of the Lord Jesus as he cast out um, demons. And these words, this, this story, this account, surely it brings a comfort to us, a comfort to us that this one that we worship has this sort of power and authority, but also surely it brings a challenge. Because we then are asked, if he has this authority, are we actually obeying him? And are we actually doing what he tells us to do? Let's pray that that authority of Jesus is made evident in our lives. In our church life, in this town, in this country, even in our generation. You know, if, if we allow this authority of Jesus to control us, we will see the same result in verse 28. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. What a prayer that is, to ask the Lord that his authority would come in our lives in such a way that it would be seen by the people outside and that the word would spread of the fame of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray and ask him to do that together. Father, we uh, started by thinking about the uh, tension, um, the way our attention is grabbed by things. And we just want to close by saying, Lord, please grab our attention. May the authority of the Lord Jesus strike us this morning. Might we be encouraged and comforted by his power and authority today. And might we be challenged to obey him, to see him as Lord and Master, the one who is above all, the one who is so majestically powerful. And we pray that as we do this, and as our church reflects this, the authority of Jesus would be made known in this town, in this, in this generation, in this area. And Jesus fame would spread everywhere for we ask it in Jesus name Amen